Amen. Acts chapter 28. So it's our second week in Acts chapter 28. So Paul um, has shipwrecked on the island of Malta, and he is now getting ready to leave. We're going to start out um, in verse number 11. They catch a ship. Um, they kept a, catch a ship out of Alexandria, and they are able to get off of this island that they were shipwrecked on after um, being there for three months. In verse number 11, the Bible says, In three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. So now they're on their way to Rome. So they're heading north, um, north towards um, Rome. And from thence, we fetched a compass and came to Reguium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Petuli, Peti, Petioli. And when we were found brethren, we found brethren, we were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went towards Rome. So um, they asked, they were asked to stay on their way to um, Rome. They were asked to stay with these um, brethren that were on the way to Rome. And look at verse number 15. Um, the Bible says, and from thence we had breath, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appi Forum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. So this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, we're not going to get any further than this. We're going to um, talk about Rome next week. We'll finish out um, the book of Acts um, next week. But really, I was kind of, I had this, like, just this message just, I felt laid on me um, about this um, situation that Paul found himself in verse number 15 here, where the Bible says that these people, the brethren, came from these far places. They heard that Paul was on his way to Rome, and they met him on his journey. And that, um, for that, the Bible says he thanked God and took courage. Um, so tonight I want to talk about the ability to encourage. Um, as, you know, as Christians, our ability to encourage. You know, today, um, you know, we have Christians where some of us have been saved for, you know, longer than other people. But the first point I want to make tonight is that we all have the ability to encourage um, our brothers and sisters in Christ. What does encourage mean? You know, we look at this idea, um, how, how the Bible puts it here on verse 15. It says, Paul took courage. You know, Paul was, was given courage. I mean, it literally says he was given courage. He took courage from these this brethren that came to see him. You know, basically, it encouraged him is what the Bible is saying here. A synonym for encourage, turn to, um, you turn to Acts um, chapter 4, if you would. Turn to Acts chapter 4. Four. So what does it mean to encourage or to give courage? You know, a synonym for that is to embolden, to embolden someone. Now, to embolden someone, that's a synonym for encouraging someone, is, is to give them boldness. So we're talking about giving courage or giving boldness. And I can't read you the amount of verses in the Bible that talk about how necessary it is for the Christian to have boldness. In the book of Acts, it's all over the book of Acts. I'll just read you a couple verses. If you're in Acts chapter 4, look at verse number 29. The Bible says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. So the Bible here is saying, you know, we've already gone through this chapter. You know, they're just, I mean, this is a common theme throughout the book of Acts. Whoever it is, whether it's Peter, the disciples, James, and just all the disciples in Jerusalem, you know, the disciples in uh, Damascus, in, in Antioch, wherever they are. That's how the church in Antioch got started, because they were being persecuted. And they got flushed out of Jerusalem, and they went north to Antioch. But what the Bible here is saying is that they're asking for boldness or, or courage. They need boldness, and they need courage to keep speaking the Word of God. They're getting, they're getting beat down for it. They're getting physically harmed for it. They're being chased and, and murdered and killed. And, and it's not just a couple chapters down the road that Stephen is literally martyred and, you know, for, you know, boldness, for preaching the word of God. All right, verse 31 of the same chapter. And when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. So their prayer was answered. They were given that boldness by the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 28, verse 31, I'll just read it for you, well, you're probably there, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Just talking about how he's just being bold and he's using this courage that he took in verse number 15. 
Turn to Proverbs chapter 28. I'll read for you Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 12. Boldness and the need for boldness is all over the Bible. It is necessary for the Christian. In Ephesians 3.12, the Bible says, In whom, talking about Jesus, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Now look at Proverbs chapter 28 and look at verse uh, number 1. Look at Proverbs chapter 28 and look at verse number 1. This verse really wraps up the need for boldness as a Christian right here. The Bible says, The wicked flee when no man pursue it, but the righteous are bold as a lion. So the Bible here is saying that the wicked people, the unsaved, they're going to be afraid of everything. They're going to be scared of everything. It's like, but the righteous, the saved, the, the Christian, the Bible-believing Christian is bold as a lion. The, the, the point I'm trying to get you to understand at the beginning of the sermon tonight is that boldness is necessary for the Christian. It's the fuel that we run off of. It's the fuel that we run off of as Bible-believing Christians. If we're going to live this Christian life, and I mean talking about living the Bible, if we're going to do the Bible, if we're going to do what God says and live this way and separate this way and serve this way and raise our children this way, it's going to require boldness. We need that. We need that fuel in our lives. And the Bible here is saying in verse number 15 of Acts chapter 28 that the brethren gave this courage to Paul. They gave this courage to Paul. He took courage from them. He took boldness from them. You say, Paul, doesn't he just have an infinite amount of boldness? No, I mean, it, it's, it, Paul needs boldness. Paul needs courage. He needed that encouragement from there. Another thing I want to point out before we even get started with the sermon is that these these disciples, these brethren, they were able to give Paul boldness through their actions. They gave Paul boldness through their actions, not just their words. Okay, I'm sure they said encouraging things, but you'll notice in Acts chapter 14 and 15 that it says they came from all these different places. They actually they took great action to come and see Paul, and that was very encouraging to him. He took courage from that. It was their action. It kind of reminded me when I was reading this, you know, it kind of reminded me, I, I wrestled from the time I was in first grade till the time I was a senior in high school, many, many years. And I remember after, you know, I was done, you know, I was graduated from high school, I, I saw my wrestling coach and I, I told my wrestling coach, who was my coach for many years um, throughout high school and even in my junior high years, I told him, I said, you know, all those times that I was in a wrestling match, and you were yelling from the sidelines. And even like my dad would be yelling from the, the, the side of, the, of the, the mat. I never heard a word he, that any of those guys said. I told my wrestling coach that. I said, you know, I was like, I never heard anything you told me, you know, during the match. You know, during, between periods and things, I, I understood what he was saying there. But during the match, it was like, I, I can't remember one thing I told him that you told me. But you know, what mattered was the actions. What mattered was the training. What mattered was you know, the things that were actually done. So the point is, Paul was emboldened, he was encouraged, he took courage through the actions of the brethren. That's what was important, okay? Actions speak louder. The Bible talks about that all over the place, all right? And what did they do? They showed up, they traveled there, they came to see him, all right? So look, I want to give you some points about encouragement tonight. Who needs encouragement? Who needs encouragement? The first point, I mean, that I already kind of told you is that the nice thing about encouragement in the Christian life is anybody can be encouraging. Anybody can be encouraging. It doesn't matter if you've been saved for a day. It doesn't matter if you've been saved for 20 years. You can be encouraging. That's one thing as a Christian. Look, a lot of things, like to be a really good like veteran soul winner, that takes a lot of work and a lot of just, just knocking doors and just a lot of experience to do that. But look, to be encouraging, you can do right now. I mean, baby John encouraged me right before the service started. I mean, I walked by him and like, I was just like, hey, and he's like, I mean, that was encouraging to me. But the point is that even just somebody visiting a church can be encouraging. Anybody can be encouraging. This is something you're like, what can I do, you know, to, to help my brothers and sisters be encouraging. You can do it. Anybody can be encouraging. If you've been saved for five seconds, you can encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. A great example of encouraging your brothers and sisters is soul winning. 
I mean, you all have felt it. You've all gone out soul winning with a group of 15, 20 people and just have a great time out soul winning with a bunch of people. That is very encouraging. Like last Sunday was really encouraging soul winning. I mean, it's always good to go soul winning, don't get me wrong, but it's more encouraging when there's more people out there together doing it. I mean, it's an encouraging thing. This is where silent partners can be very encouraging. You don't even have to be a, a, a talker out there. Just, just being there is, is, you know, I have a friend in Sacramento. He's just a silent partner. He's been a silent partner for as long as I've known him. But it's very encouraging to go soul winning with him. You know, he just encourages you as you go. So the point is, encouraging your brothers and sisters is very important in this Christian life. And soul winning, look, soul winning is a perfect example of how we can encourage um, one another. All right, we all need encouragement. But I'm gonna to start tonight with the people that need encouragement the most in our lives. And then I'm gonna kind of work down the line. And you know, let me just say this. I'm gonna give some specific examples tonight, and these are not anecdotal. I have seen every single one of these examples. All right, I'm gonna give some horrible examples of the opposite of encouragement tonight. And I've seen every single one of these things happen. All right, and you're going to listen to these, these really bad ones up front, and you're going to be like, oh, that's terrible, but I'm going to get to yours. And I'll even talk about some things that I've changed in my life as far as encouragement and making sure that I am an encouragement to the people that I need to be an encouragement to in my life. This is super important in the Christian life, folks. All right, the first people that I'm going to talk about tonight that need encouragement is your kids. I want to talk about tonight, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to spend a lot of time on this one, but our kids need encouragement. And I'm going, to explain, I'm going to explain why they need encouragement first. And then I'm going to tell you, you know, some things that you can do to stop the encouragement of your kids, to actually work against that encouragement. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Look, your kids need discipline. Your kids need discipline. And the Bible says that. The Bible says that you should discipline your children. Your children should obey you. Your children, if they do not obey you, the Bible says you should spank your children. You know, you should do this. If you don't discipline your children, the Bible says you hate them. I mean, this is how serious the Bible is about this. But look, here's the thing you need to understand. Don't be all negative raising your children. Your kids need encouragement in their life. Your kids need to know, look, unless you have some kind of child that's just wrong all the time and does everything wrong all the time, nobody has that type of child, by the way. But be encouraging. You know, it's, it's, don't be all negative. Yes, there is the sit up straight and chew with your mouth closed and brush your teeth and all these things and do your chores and all these different things. But, you know, do this, do that, but there must be some positive. There must be some encouraging. There must be a, a, a good job. You know, there must be, hey, you did that right. Hey, thanks for doing that for me. You know, there has to be some positive when you're raising your kids. Are you in Ephesians chapter 4? Ephesians chapter 4. I think I got messed up here. Hang on. In Ephesians, actually, Ephesians chapter 6. I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter 6. You got to have some positive in your life when you're raising your kids. That's the point I'm trying to make. All right? But really, what I want to talk about tonight is the spiritual encouragement of your children. And you're going to keep your place in Ephesians chapter 6, and you're going to go to Matthew chapter 19. I kind of need to go to these places at the same time. I want to explain to you something tonight that you need to understand about children. Okay, and this is why I hope I can explain this properly. Because it's super important that you know this about your kids. I want to explain to you why, and if you're a soul winner, you are really going to understand this. But I want to explain to you one thing that you will notice out soul winning. If you've been soul winning, one thing that you will notice is that kids want to come to a Bible-believing church. You will see this with kids on the street. You will see this with kids in homes. They want to come to church. They want to be here. You say, why is that? And you know what? When they do come here, they, they love it here. Not, they're not saved. They've maybe even never been to a church. But they will come here and they will love it here. Why? Why? Especially 
the young ones. You say, why is that? I mean, think about it. Kids that have never been to a church, they'll come here and they will love it here. You will see kids out on the street and they will just be like, we want to come to your church and we want to come and they'll be asking their parents to come. Are you in Matthew 19? Look down at Matthew 19, verse number 14. This is why. We need to understand this so we can understand our own children. Okay, look at Matthew 19 and verse number 14. Matthew 19 and verse number 14, the Bible says, But Jesus said, Suffer the little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. So the disciples were kind of shooing the kids away. They were trying to get close to Jesus. And Jesus makes this profound statement here. And he says, No, do not let them, you know, do not push them away, because he says, Of such is the kingdom of heaven. You know what he's saying, and this is very similar to the philosophy that I taught in the Age of Accountability sermon, but what he is saying is that the nature of children is the nature of heaven, is what he is saying. This is why you will see kids that want to be in church. And the younger they are, and the less influence that they've had from the outside world, the more that they will want to be in that church. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. But you just remember, of such is the kingdom of heaven. You see, they're pure. They're undefiled. This is why the Satan-worshipping reprobates of this world are after them. Because they are pure and they are undefiled. And Satan wants to corrupt what is not corrupted. Because as such is the kingdom of heaven, and Satan wants to destroy that. So when everybody's all shocked today about, oh, why are the, they're all confused, and they're all shocked. Why are the LGBTQT, whatever, trying to get into all the schools? They don't have any kids. They don't have children. By the very unnatural state of them, they, we, they don't have children. No, they want your children. Why? Because this is Satan's agenda. That's why. It's to, it's to corrupt the pure. Because as such is the kingdom of heaven. And Satan is trying to destroy the kingdom of heaven and everything that has anything to do with it. But as such is the kingdom of heaven. That's the children. And that's why the children want to be in church. By default, what I'm, here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. By default, children have a desire for the things of God. Thank God for that. Amen. What a blessing that is. That's why they love a biblical church. That's why they want to come here. And it's heartbreaking when you see kids out soul winning that want to come to church whose parents will never bring them. I was a few months ago, a few months ago, I was out soul winning and a kind of a rare situation happened to me where I can't remember who I was with, but we walked up to this driveway, and there's this kid out in the middle of the driveway, maybe 12 or 13 years old, and I asked him if his parents were home. I asked him if his parents would mind if I talked to him. I told him who I was, and he said no, and he was super interested. The, the boy um, wanted to hear what the Bible had to say. I opened the Bible to show it to him, and he said this kid's walking around his front yard like a normal kid, and he says... You have to hold the Bible closer because I can't see it. He's, he's blind. He gets saved. My wife and I go and we do follow-ups the next week with this family. I'm thinking about this kid. And we go to his house, and he's now there with his brothers and his mom. And he's told his brothers everything about the conversation that we had in his driveway. I, you know, he doesn't know enough to give the gospel, but he's told them about this guy who was the pastor of this church that came and, and, and showed him about Jesus, and he got saved, and, and he was super excited about his brothers, and, and we saw him there and he's just begging his mother can, can we go to church but you know we've never seen him look it's <laughs> it's heartbreaking because they want to be here 
But this is why, because why do they want to be here? Because as such is the kingdom of heaven. That's why. That's why they want to be here. Are you in Ephesians chapter 6? Look at verse number 4. This is our job. We must understand this about our children. And this is why the Bible says this. It says, ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The Bible here is following up what Jesus said in Matthew 19, saying, as such is the kingdom of heaven, it's there for you to protect it. It's there for you to protect it. Protect God's saying, protect what's already there, is what he is saying. You say, man, these people are, are terrible. They won't bring their kids to church. They won't nurture this desire for their children to come to church and learn about the Lord. But you know what? Even Christian parents can fail at this. And I'm going to give you four categories that I have seen specifically Christian parents fail at. And I'm going to start with the worst ones. And you're going to, you're going to listen to the worst ones. And these are not anecdotes. I've seen this. These are not anecdotes. You're going to hear these worst ones. You'll be like, they're terrible. But I'm going to get to yours. I'm going to get to yours. And I'll even tell you where I've changed some things in my life because of this. Christian parents fail at nurturing, protecting what God put there in the children. They fail at that. The first one is this, and this is the worst, this is the worst Christian parent. This is the worst Christian parent. They punish their children using spiritual things. Turn to Hosea chapter 8. The Bible says the opposite of the nurture and admonition is provo you provoke your children to wrath. But turn to Hosea chapter 8 and verse number 7. Hosea chapter 8 and verse number 7. These Christian parents... Will put, they will use what God put there as leverage against their children. And it's wicked as hell to, to use what God has put there and ask that they put in their protection, protective custody to use it against their children. This is the parent that says, you listen to me or we're not going to church. You do that again and we're not going to church. You ask about going to church, and we won't go. They punish using Bible, the Bible. Write Bible verses. Oh, Yo, you messed up. Write a Bible verse 150 times. Let's take a wonderful good thing and turn it into a horrible bad thing. You're not going to that activity that you want to go to unless you do what I say. They punish them using the spiritual things. They take that leverage that they have. They were given this thing that God put there and that they are supposed to protect and build and they use it to their own advantage. It's wicked. It's wicked as hell, but I, I, I'm sick of seeing it. But let me tell you something. This might be the most the biggest example of Hosea 8, 7, where these people, they, they're sowing the wind. They have sown the wind, the Bible says. The Bible says they have sown the wind. They will reap the whirlwind. If you remember in Matthew 18 and Luke 17, Jesus says, you know, if you cause offense to one of these little ones, it would be better if a millstone were hung around your neck. We always apply that to reprobates and people that would actually physically hurt children. But you know what? Damaging your children spiritually is, is causing offense to them. They, you know what that, that means? They have sown the wind and they will reap the whirlwind. You know what that means? That means that the price, they will pay a price. And this is true. And I don't want to see it. And, 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 but I'm going to see it and I'm going to continue to see it as long as I see this thing happening. They will pay a price that they never would have agreed to pay if they would have known what they were doing. You say, that's crazy. That's crazy. No one in this church would ever do that. Here's another one, and this is kind of a crazy one too. Just talking bad about church in your home. 
is, is, is something that will damage that in your children. It will turn church into a bad thing for them. But I, I, I've seen this as well. You can see the kids turn. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. It defiles what was supposed to be encouraged, what was supposed to be built and strengthened. God help the people that turn on every church. You know, God help their children because they're sowing the wind. They're just sowing the wind and sowing the wind and sowing the wind. And they're going to reap the whirlwind because they're damaging what God put there. They're damaging what God put there for them to protect. How about this one? As a little kid, I can even remember examples of this one. How about parents that just argue over church? Maybe one parent's into it, one parent not so much. Church just becomes a matter of strife in the home. You know what that does? That, 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 mean, that damages what's inside them, and church equals strife to the kids. Even these smaller things. Look, this spirit that they have, the Bible literally says, as such is the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand what you have in your kids? As such is the kingdom of heaven. Every unsaved five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old that we meet out on the street, as such is the kingdom of heaven. That needs to be built and protected. It's already there. You literally have to ruin it. I mean, that's hope for the future, at least. Look, as a pastor, I've grown in this area over the last four or five years. And I haven't been a pastor for four or five years, but there are many ways. Look, and first of all, my kids, whether they like it or not, there's many ways my kids are in the ministry with me. And my wife, she's in the ministry with me. But I have to be careful the attitude I have around the kids. I mean, my kids are, my kids are older. My kids are stronger because they're older and they're more mature than, than like a pastor with little kids. But look, I'm still much more careful about this than I was at the beginning of this whole thing. I have to be, because here's the thing, and you know what, Pastor, Pastor Jimenez always put it this way, just like a good little piece of wisdom that he, that he told me, and he's just like, because here's the thing, folks, in the ministry, and I know that I can't explain this to you, but in the ministry, there's always ups and downs. There's always some people that are up, and some people that are down. That's just the way it is all the time. What if I walked into my house and I was just focusing on the downs all the time? Pastor Jimenez put it to me this way, and I hope he wouldn't mind me saying this, but he, he would say to me sometimes, he would say, you know what? Well, uh, you know, when problem A goes away, problem B becomes problem A. You know what he's saying? That there's always going to be problems. And I could just go, and, and my kids could, eat, you know, the kids could, could see the church, the ministry, equals dad stressed out all the time. That's what they could see. They could see that this Christian life that they're in, this ministry that they're in, just equals bad. Just equals stress and sadness. I need to protect the kids from that. You know what I need? To, I'll get to this in a little bit, but I need to protect my wife from that, too. Look, there's always going to be ups and downs. And, and guess what? Here's the thing. We are strong. They are not, is what we need to understand. And if such, such is the kingdom of heaven, it is such a great gift. We need, to, look, we, not to, we need to not only protect it from the corruption and the sickness and the, uh, the corruption of Satan's world, we need to protect and nurture the spiritual desire within them. So I hope you think about these things tonight. And guess what, though? If you do protect it, if you do protect it no matter how you're feeling or where you're at, guess what? You will succeed. And they will grow up and they will learn to serve the Lord on their own. And, and, it, and it will work if it's protected. If it's nurtured. If it's what? If it's encouraged. If they take courage from you. They will be strong. But they aren't now. And that's what you need to understand about your children. Here's, a, here's the, the least extreme version of this. 
And if I haven't gotten you so far, I'm going to get you here. The least extreme version of this is, you know, just, with, just when you're in a spiritual valley in your life. When you're in a spiritual valley in your life, and look, I encourage you to, you know, if you get in a spiritual valley in your life, to get out of it as soon as possible. But if you are in a su uh, spiritual valley in your life, don't drag your kids down into the valley with you. Because the thing that you have to understand is you are stronger than they are. And if you drag them down into the valley, you will bounce back, but there will be damage that is done there. There will be damage that is done, and they will always remember. They will always remember that valley that you're in. And, and look, they will be this spiritual, this, this as such as the kingdom of heaven will be scarred a little bit. And we need to protect it as good and as perfectly as we possibly can. So look, just here's, some, here's a couple of rules. Here's a couple of rules for you tonight. You're like, okay, here, here's the first rule. Don't ever use... The fact that as, as such is the kingdom of heaven in your children, don't ever use that against them, ever. That's an easy one. And then rule two, look, because if you do do that, if you do do that, you will pay a price that I guarantee you were not willing to pay if you do that. And the second one is just you need to do everything you can possibly do to encourage, to strengthen, to nurture this God-given gift that they have, this desire that they have. You know what? You, you need to talk to your kids, too. You know why? Because that will always give you a, a measure on where they are. And I've been doing this for years and years and years with my kids, just talking to them. You know, what do you mean? How, how was your day today? How was your day at church? How's everything going? How was um, your activity that you went to? How are these things? You know, and I, I mean, I'm annoying about it. I really am. I'm like, I mean, I still talk to like my older kids, not so much Garrett, but I mean, I still talk to the older kids about this, Ashley smiling because I annoy her. And I'm like, okay, scale of one to 10. And I just keep going, she's like, dad. Ah. But you need to have your finger on the pulse of this. There's a method to the madness. There's a reason that I do it because I want to know if there's something going on where I'm not doing a good enough job. And you need to know what's going on with your kids. And even when your spiritual life is suffering, and I hope nobody's spiritual life is suffering, but even if your spiritual life is suffering, don't bring your kids into that because they can't sustain the hits that you can. So look, Let's go back to Paul. Let's go back to Paul. The ultimate way to encourage. How do I encourage my kids? How do I encourage my family? The ultimate way to encourage is to be present. The ultimate way to encourage is to be at those activities with them. Don't discourage and use an activity that they want to go to at church as something to punish them. Be there with them. Be part of it. Be present. You know, let them know that, you know what, when we're at church, church is good. When we're doing spiritual things, spiritual things are good. When we're going soul winning. Look, you may feel like going soul winning some days where it's like, oh, I don't really feel like going soul winning today. Look, you may not admit it, but you're going to feel like that every now and then. And you know what? You put a face on. Amen. Put a face on. Why? Protect them. They can't take the hits. Like you can. You can have a bad day, and you can be stressed out about things, and you don't have to just like let everyone know about everything. Be there with them. Be present, just like the people with Paul in verse number 15. How did, they, how did he take courage from there? They were there. They came there. They were, they were there, and they were positive. You know what? Let the kids see that, you know what? This is all good for us. Encourage your spouse. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Look, wives, wives should encourage their husbands. You say, well, what does that mean? Wives should encourage his leadership is what they should do. You know, there's two different 
perspectives. It's really interesting on this one. On the whole, you know, biblical, you know, perspective of the wife is to just submit to her husband's leadership. That's what the Bible teaches. You know, the Bible doesn't, you know, condone some wife bossing her husband around. The husband's in charge. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. That's what God wants. The man's in charge. The wife, though, you know, and it, you know, the world doesn't understand this. Because the, the, the woman out in the world, the feminist today is like, you know, the opposite of the Bible woman today is, the, you know, the opposite of Proverbs 31. She's like, I'm not listening to that idiot. I'm not going to listen to that fool. I'm not going to let that, you know, I mean, that's, that's how they feel about their husbands. And they, think, they look at a Christian woman that would decide to submit to her husband's leadership and they, don't, they can't even, it's another dimension to them. They can't understand it. Whereas the Christian woman's like, yeah, I'm going to listen to my husband because my husband's awesome. He's a good leader. He's a, he's a Bible-reading, Bible-knowledgeable, you know, Bible-believing Christian. He's, he's a strong Christian man. They can't fathom that. They can't see it. It's two completely different perspectives. But the wife should support her husband's leadership. Turn to 1 Peter chapter, one, or chapter 3. Husbands... Husbands, look at verse number 7. It says, likewise, ye husbands, husbands need to understand this. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Talking about the wives, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Husbands need to defend and protect their wives' role. They need to defend and protect their wives because, let me tell you something, your wife is under attack today. Your Christian wife is under attack. Your Christian homeschooling wife is under attack by just about everybody today, outside of the walls of this Bible-believing institution right here. Your wife is under attack, and she's the weaker vessel. You know what? They're going to attack her, and that's why we need to protect our wives and our children because you know what? Satan's coming out. He's trying to come in through that way because it's the, it's the easiest way in. You know, lead in a positive way. Be an encouragement in a positive way. You know what? Your wife doesn't need to know every single thing that you're stressed about at every single moment. I'm not saying, you know, hide things from your wife. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that you have to take into account that she is weaker than you. What does that mean? She is emotionally weaker than you. She is physically weaker than you and she is spiritually weaker than you. You say, oh, I know some wife that's way more spiritual than her husband. This is the way the hierarchy is supposed to be. You are supposed to be the spiritually, physically, and emotionally strong one. You don't need to go and like panic your wife over every tiny little thing. Be some baby that comes home and sits on the couch and just blurts out everything, every baby concern you have. Because you know what you're going to do? You're going to do the same thing to your wife that I was talking about doing to the kids. You're going to, you're going to tear her down. You're going to break her. Because she's not going to sit there and say, oh, you're stressed about all this and this and the business and the finances and all this. And, and, and she's not going to sit there and be like, it's going to be fine. This is going to be fine. This is going to be fine. This is going to be fine. She's going to be like, we're toast. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna break her because she's the weaker vessel. That's what the Bible's saying. So be an encouragement to her. Maybe, maybe be stronger yourself. Maybe go talk to you know, a brother in Christ and you know, get some encouragement from there for your, if, you, if you need a pat on the head or whatever you need or call me or whatever, but don't just stress your wife out with every little tiny thing that you're worried about. And you know what? Be there. You say, how do you encourage your wife? Be there. Show up. Sit next to her for 10 minutes. Just plop down right next to her on the couch. And she's like, what are you doing? And she's like, I don't know. I'm just sitting here. You know what that will do? That will encourage her. Encourage your wife. Be there. Satan's coming for your wife and Satan's coming for your kids. He's not coming after the strong, spiritual, Christian leader of his household. He's looking for, for cracks. And the Bible is telling us that like, it's our job to make sure that these things are shored up, to protect our children in all ways, spiritually protect them, to protect our wives in all ways. 
physically, emotionally, spiritually. And encourage them. Look, it's hard. It's hard. You know, this homeschooling is, is hard. It's hard. I mean, we've got two kids in school right now. And, and if, if you're doing it correctly, it's very hard and it's very stressful. This is why I never really started, uh, never really went home and did remote work. Because it just, I was just in the way. And I wanted my wife to not be stressed out. And I wanted her to be able to continue doing her things. And I just, I just stay and I just encourage and encourage and I encourage. And I help where I'm needed to help. But I don't get in the way. And I don't mess things up. I, I encourage. It's hard. It's hard to do. If you're doing it right, it, it, a good Christian mom has major responsibilities, despite what Satan will tell you. Despite what Satan's little minions, and I don't care what forms those little minions come in, all these little snide comments from, from your relatives or your, friend, your friends or, or whatever, this is how it happened to us. All those little snide comments would sneak in all the time, very discouraging. That's where you need to step in and, and stop those things as the leader and then encourage and build up. So look, the, the point I'm trying to get across tonight, folks, is that encouragement in the Christian life this giving of courage, this giving of boldness is absolutely necessary. And this is what Ecclesiastes 4 is talking about where it says, you know, two are, are stronger than, than one and a threefold core is not, threefold cord is not quickly broken. It's saying, it's, it's saying, you know, diversify your strengths. When you're up, two of us will hold you. Or when you're down, two of us will pick you up. If you're by yourself and there's no one to encourage you, this is the person, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave a good church, and I'm going to move here, and I'm going to go soul winning by myself. No, you won't. You might for two weeks. You might for two months, but it's incredibly discouraging if you don't have people around you, you know, giving you that fuel that you need, which is boldness. God knows this. God knows this, and this is why, you know, he shows us that even Paul, for crying out loud, even Paul, the strongest e evangelist that anybody could ever think of took courage from people. He needed courage from people. And look, I'm trying to get you to understand that no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been saved, you have the ability to give that courage and give that boldness to your brothers and sisters. And we have the ability to give that boldness to our children to protect their spiritual, you know, kingdom of heaven nature that they have and keep that pure, and keep that undefiled, we get that from each other. We get that from each other. Be an encouragement. Be an encouragement. Think about this. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.